So let's go through these here, guys. So what substance is embedded in the cell walls and supports the stem of a plant? Lignin. Yeah. Lignin is the stuff that okay, makes plants uh, develop like hard wood-like stems. Okay. All right, so lignin is the answer there. What structures control water loss from leaves? I'll actually accept two answers for this one. Stomata is one. Okay, stomates, stomata, okay, whichever, as long as, they, as long as they have that. What's the other one? Uh, that's what makes up the stomates. I, I'll say, okay, let's accept three answers there, because those are part of the stomates, so that would technically also be right. Guard cells, and one other thing. Oh, okay, nobody wrote it. I was thinking cuticle as well. Right? Does the cuticle prevent water loss? Okay, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really control it. It prevents it. So technically, these two things would be the most correct answers. Right? And, and if you were looking at a multiple choice question, okay, where it was worded like that, what structures control, uh, control water loss from leaves? And you were given A, cuticle, B, spongy layer, C, stomates, D, roots. Okay? The most correct answer would still be stomates because they actually control, whereas the cuticle just covers the whole plant. Everybody follow me on that one? Okay, so it's, it's one of those kind of, well, that's sort of right, but it's not the most correct answer kind of thing. Okay, number three, a root system that spreads out far but not deep is a fibrous root system. Okay, number four, a single deep root is a tap root. Number five, the sugar produced by a plant is transported in phloem. Number six, um, what kind of pressure is in the water vacuoles? Turger pressure, right? Okay, number seven, in the leaf, photosynthesis occurs mainly in the palisade layer. Okay, and in the leaf, water is stored in the spongy layer. And water transport in plants uses these two behaviors of water, one mark each for cohesion and adhesion. One mark each. So one mark for cohesion, one mark for adhesion. All right, so it's out of 10. Give them a mark out of 10. Let them see it. Put it in the box. So what we got to go over today, guys, are the factors that affect plant growth. Because we really didn't touch on that yesterday. Mostly we talked about, you know, the hormones and the things that plants can do to change their shape and adapt to changing conditions. But we didn't really talk about what kind of conditions plants really require and what kind of uh, things they need. So that's what we're going to go over today are the factors that affect plant growth. So we're going to look at the components that affect uh, plant growth and then understand how each and one of, each one of them does that. Yeah. Oh, is Okay. All right, so when we look at an ecosystem, okay, and that may be a term you haven't heard for a while, okay, an ecosystem is essentially a place where many organisms interact, okay, um, there's two types of components. There are abiotic components, which are all the non-living things that would be in an ecosystem, all right, and then there are the biotic components, which are all the organisms and how they interact with each other. Right, that could be like predator-prey relationships, uh, which things are decomposers, which things are producers and carnivores and all that kind of stuff. Okay, um, So those would be the biotic ones. But the abiotic ones, believe it or not, are probably the most important ones, Okay, especially from the point of view of plants, because they are dependent on abiotic factors to survive, whereas we're more dependent on biotic factors as an animal. We need other living things. Okay, We can't eat rocks. Well, we could, but it wouldn't be much good. All right. Okay. So the non-living parts of the ecosystem are the abiotic components. Okay. So non-living okay, parts of the ecosystem. So in this picture, what would be some abiotic components? Okay. Precipitation, availability of water. Okay. Would be one. Sunlight. Yeah, absolutely. That's an abiotic factor. That's the source of energy for all ecosystems. It's kind of important. The rocks, yeah, the minerals that they would provide as they erode and weather. Okay, what else? 
give you a hint, the rocks are sitting on it. The soil, yeah. Okay, soil is crucially important, especially since where does so where does soil come from? It actually comes from rocks. Okay, soil is weathered rock and bits of organic material, decomposing stuff. Okay, that's what soil is. You can't get soil until rocks have had time to weather and wear, which is why if you go into the mountains and you go up, you know, kind of really high up, way above the tree line where the glaciers are, there isn't any. It's just rocks, rocks and ice. Those rocks have been trapped under glaciers for thousands of years and haven't had time to weather and build up soil yet. And any time they do weather, usually that gets carried downhill by water and deposited somewhere else. Right. Okay, so that's a pretty good start for the uh, abiotic components and then obviously the biotic components would be the grass and the, the sort of food chain relationship that we see here and that kind of stuff. Okay, one that you couldn't really see on that is temperature. Okay, temperature is a crucial abiotic factor because if it drops below zero, plants are in trouble. All right, because what can plants not do when it's below zero? They can't carry out photosynthesis if it's below zero because water is, yeah, it's a solid, all right? It's pretty hard to evaporate water, okay, when it's frozen. So plants aren't transporting water when it's frozen, okay? So there's not a lot of photosynthesis going on, okay, during that time. So we kind of need to be, you know, in a liquid form above zero degrees, okay? The other problem is that most organisms can't regulate their body temperature. Mammals can, but we're a pretty small percentage of the overall you know, number of organisms on Earth. Okay, um, if you got like bugs, lizards, okay, things like that, they don't really have an ability to regulate their body temperature. Certainly, plants don't have any ability to do that. And so, when it drops below certain temperatures, essentially food chains can start to stall because the first step in the food chain, the producers, has now essentially been stopped, and they can't they can't start making food for anybody else. Okay, so plants are affected by temperatures. If they become too hot, they lose too much water, and they have to shut down their photosynthesis. So high temperatures can also have the same effect. Okay, uh, or when they get too cold, ice crystals can form in their cells. Okay, if that happens, then vacuoles rupture and cells are in trouble. Okay, enzymes start to break down if you get extremes in temperature, things like that. Okay, and the other thing is water. Okay, water is essential. Okay, but its availability on Earth varies quite widely from place to place. All right? I mean, around here in Canada, we don't think much about water because it's just a given that it's always around. Okay? We're extraordinarily rich in terms of availability of water. Right? But if you go to other places in the world, that is not the case at all. all right? If you go to like Tunisia or you know, Namibia or something like that, somewhere in Africa in the middle of the desert, okay, water availability is practically nil. Right? If you've ever seen what Tunisia looks like, it's the place they use to film any scene in a movie that's going to have rolling sand dunes. Okay? If you've seen Star Wars, it's where Tatooine is always filmed. Okay? It's where like just nothing but sand dunes. All right? It's worse than it's more sandy and dry than Egypt. Okay? Uh, so water availability varies drastically. Now that's not just in hot places, but also in cold places. What's the driest continent? Antarctica. Even though it's covered in a kilometer thick sheet of ice, there isn't any liquid water there. Right? It is technically the driest continent. It gets the least precipitation of any continent on Earth. Right? It gets a little bit of snow every year, but that's about it. Okay? It doesn't get rain of any sort of measurable nature. All right. So water is essential to life, but like we said, it varies drastically, and so does its quality. Right? I mean, you could have really salty water if you were in a marsh near the ocean or things like that. So water is crucial, but like we say, the amount and kind of it you can get depends on where you are. All right, sunlight. We said sunlight already. Sunlight provides energy that drives nearly all ecosystems with the exception of a few very deep sea, benthic, hydrothermal vents kind of communities. All right, but only plants are capable of harnessing it. Right, and that's that's a big deal, right? How many of you guys remember talking about the food pyramid? Okay, like in grade eight science. Okay, you remember that? Why does it why is it shaped like a pyramid? Why are producers at the bottom and top carnivores at the top? And why is it so much smaller up here? Okay, are there a lot of blades of grass? A lot of trees, a lot of plants, right? Okay, 
but there's only like in an ecosystem maybe one or two of the top carnivore. Why? Why are there so many more blades of grass than there are wolves or bears? Yeah, you're on the right track. It does have something to do with balance. Okay, the producers can make their own food provided sunlight is around, whereas the top carnivores have to find their food. And it's partly that as well. Yes. Yeah, you guys are all on the right track here. It's actually something called the 10% rule. Okay, it takes a lot of it takes a lot of organisms from the from the level below to feed the ones on the top because of the 10% rule. If you're a cow and you eat grass, you only are able to harness 10% of the energy available in the grass. Okay? So, the grass captures energy from the sun a lot, okay? So it, it gets there that's why there's so many plants around. There's lots of available energy, lots of carbon dioxide, so there's lots of plants. Okay? But there's obviously a lot fewer herbivores because again, even though there's lots of grass, they can only harness about 10%. And then the next layer up can only get 10% of the layer below it. Only 10% of the energy that cow consumes in its lifetime is passed on to the organism that eats it. All right? That's why it's so costly energy-wise and material-wise to eat meat. All right? And so, um, I mean, a lot of people will tell you that if everybody just ate, like, you know, plants and stuff, uh, we'd be able to feed the entire, the entire world because we wouldn't be feeding cows and chickens and stuff and wasting all this energy. No, I mean, I like steak. You know, I like chicken. Right. You, you know, you have, to, you have to sort of balance that out. Certainly it does take a lot of, we take a lot of the, f the grain and feed that we grow and feed it to animals so that we can eat the animals. It's probably not the most efficient use of the food available. Right. I'm not going to argue that it probably isn't the most efficient, but I like steak, okay. and I like bacon, and whatever else. Okay, you have to sort of—I mean, you have to consider that, you know, animals are there, and we're supposed to eat them. Are we supposed to have as many of them as we have? Probably not, but okay, you get the idea here that it costs energy each level up, and that's why you see fewer and fewer animals as you go up the pyramid. Okay, they can only get 10% of the energy from the level below, so there's going to be a lot less of them. Okay, because there isn't enough enough energy as you go up. Does that make sense? All right. Another one, light. Okay. So we had sunlight, but light itself, not just sunlight, but I mean it is sunlight, but it changes depending on where you are. Okay. Obviously, we're starting to see that now, right? Like, I know when I came to school this morning, the sun wasn't up yet. Okay. And I know that when I go for my run at five o'clock in the morning, the sun hasn't been up for that run since September. Okay. The days are getting shorter and shorter all right does that affect the organisms in our part of the world it certainly does okay we talked about how that signals plants to go dormant it's also what tells geese to fly south okay that's not based on temperature that's why there's still a whole bunch of them here okay if they were smart they would have left when the snow flew or before that okay when it started to get cold but they rely on the length of day to tell them when to fly south and sometimes that'll burn you okay when you get that wicked cold snap in September. Okay, that's pretty hard on geese and ducks and stuff. All right, so migration and things like that are often cued by how long the day is. Plants will typically do all their flowering and fruit growing when the days are longest. Okay, so all of that is cued by, uh, by light. Okay, a lot of uh, animal mating cycles are also Okay, cued by when when light is uh, at a certain peak. All right, if you uh, if you're an animal, you probably don't want to be having your young in the coldest part of the year. All right? So typically the spring, okay, or late winter is when animals mate. That way they're having their babies when the, there's most when the most food is available and they've got the longest period of time with warm weather. Okay? That's that's the best time for them to do that. All right? And so oftentimes that's when those kind of things happen. Everybody with me? Okay. All right. Wind. Wind is a huge factor because wind amplifies the effects not only of temperature, okay, but it also amplifies the effects of evaporation. Okay? I mean, if you are just sitting in a chair on a really hot day, you just feel like the right? You're just sweating like crazy, and because you're not moving, you just keep sweating. But if you get up and walk around, do you feel a little bit better? 
Okay? Well, you should. Because if you get up and walk around, you'll evaporate the sweat on your body faster and you'll cool. Okay? You'll cool a lot better. That's why we sit in front of a fan lots of times. Okay? If you just sit in a chair and just sweat, maybe you like that. I don't know. Okay? But if you just sit there and you just sweat, you're kind of like, man, it's so hot. But you put a fan in front of you, suddenly you feel a lot better. It's not because it's any colder. Okay? The fan's still blowing the hot air that's surrounding you at you. But the increased movement of air past you helps to evaporate your sweat and cool you off. Okay? So it works nicely for us. But for plants, windy days means they lose more water. Right? More water evaporates from the soil, more water evaporates from the surface of the, uh, from the stomates and things like that. So it can really increase the effects of that evaporation, but it also increases this. Okay? Convection. We'll talk more about that in the last unit, but convection is one of the methods of heat transfer. Okay? And when anytime there's a movement of a fluid, be it a, w a liquid or a gas, okay, that's convection. Hot air rises, cool air descends. That's convection. All right? And so as wind blows past you, it takes some of your energy. All right? And this is why we have the wind chill in the wintertime. All right? You go outside, you look outside, or you look at the temperature, and it's like, oh, it's only minus 5. That's not so bad. You step outside, it's blowing like 60 clicks an hour, and it feels like it's minus 30. Right? The reason it feels that way is as that wind hits you, it takes some of your energy and then it's gone. And more cold air comes by to which you transfer your energy and then it's gone. So it really amplifies the effect of how quickly you can lose your energy. And that's the same for all animals, plants, etc. Okay? So it's a big concern in terms of how much energy can be lost with wind. Okay? Wind chill is a big factor and that's why you know, obviously we wear you know, big thick coats and things like that. We can insulate against the effects of the wind. But if you got your fingers exposed, okay, do they get cold a lot faster on a windy day? Yeah, way faster, right? All right, so you can see here kind of what we're talking about, effects of evaporation. Actually, can I have you turn off that front bank of lights because we need to see this picture here a bit. Thank you. All right, so you can see here on these trees, these trees are um, they're growing in what's called a crummels form. Okay, you're never going to need to know that term, but okay, it's called a crummels form. And what happens is trees at really high altitudes, right near the tree line, are often exposed to very icy, very strong winds during the winter time. And those can be very harmful to their leaves, needles, whatever. So what they'll do is they'll grow in a weird shape that creates a wind shadow for their leaves. Okay? So what you see here is these trees will kind of grow bent like this. Okay? And they'll grow all of their foliage on one side. That way when the wind comes, because usually the wind has a prevailing direction, okay, the trunk creates a wind shadow for this foliage and protects it. And it catches snow, which kind of piles up on top of it and insulates it. Right? And so they can survive against these harsh conditions. Because otherwise, being in an ice, icy wind is like being in a sandstorm. Okay? It, it's like a sandblaster. It can just strip the, the bark or the skin right off of you. Okay? And so you have to be mindful of that. And this is one of the ways that they survive in those conditions. Rather than growing up tall, they grow dwarfed. Okay? These are, these are Engelmann spruce, by the way. Okay, it's a type of pine tree, and they typically grow kind of dwarfed like that in those kind of conditions. Whereas you see over here, in this stand of trees, they're quite a bit taller. Okay, does that make sense? Okay, so a wind, wind again can cause changes in the way things grow. All right, and we talked about that yesterday, right? and we talked about those different plants. Okay, they all look different because they have different growing conditions. All right, rocks and soil. So the physical structure, that means sandy or more clay or lots of loam, okay, or lots of organic material, okay, pH, so whether it's acidic or basic, mineral composition of rocks and soil, limit the distribution of plants, and then obviously affect the animals that will be in that area as well. All right, if there's only certain types of plants and they're hard to eat, you're not going to have a lot of animals around because there's not a lot of food to eat. Right. So the availability or abundance of soil nutrients greatly influences the type of plants that can grow in an area. Around here, what's our soil like? Is it thick? Yeah, in most places on the prairies, the soil is very thick. All right. Quite deep, quite thick. All right. I mean, obviously, there's a few places in town where you, know, you dig down two feet and you hit the bedrock, but those are pretty few and far between. Okay. Most places around here, you can dig quite a long way. You might hit a clay layer, and then well underneath that would be rock. So we've got lots of lots of thick soil with lots of nutrients and minerals. If you go up higher into the mountains, 
okay, where this picture is taken, um, that's as far in as I could jam that little trowel. Okay, how much of it's in the ground? Not much. In fact, it's it's being supported by a rock I stuck behind. You couldn't see it in the picture, okay, because it wouldn't stand up on its own. I couldn't jam it in the dirt far enough for it to stand up on its own. That's how rocky the dirt was. Okay, so is there much soil there? No. Okay, very little. It's not very nutrient dense because, well, it's mostly rocks. So what do you see growing here? A few kind of scrubby patches of grass and and some mosses and some you know um, kind of some evergreen type of juniper type stuff that's really really hardy, right? But you don't see a lot of really good food type. Um, plants, right? So you're not going to see a lot of animals around here. Okay, pH is another thing. All of that stuff is based on what kind of rocks you have. Okay, around Okotoks, our, our soil is quite sandy because the stone around here is mostly sandstone. Yeah, and so as it weathers, it makes the soil quite sandy. If you go into the mountains, it's mostly limestone, so you get kind of a darker but more powdery kind of fine soil. It feels more like baking soda okay, between your fingers, whereas the soil here feels gritty between your fingers. Right? And if you go up to like Red Deer Edmonton area, you get a lot more loam because, again, it's not as much sandstone there. It's more limestone and things like that, and so you get kind of a finer, uh, darker soil, whereas down here our soils are lighter because they're mostly sand. Okay? Does that sort of make sense? That can all determine what kind of soil you have. Also, what can determine what kind of soil you have are the conditions it's exposed to. Because our soil is well ventilated and exposed to the atmosphere a lot, it tends to remain fairly neutral. But if you have a soil that's often submerged or flooded for part of the year, it can tend to get quite acidic because it starts to build up carbon dioxide. Right? It can't. There's nothing to ventilate it, and so the bacteria in there start carrying out fermentation, and the soil can get acidic. Right? Underneath spruce trees, the soil tends to be quite acidic as well, because their needles, when they fall off, okay, make the soil acidic. It's how they poison other plants and keep them from growing around their roots. Okay, we talked about that the other day, didn't we? Yeah. Okay. Uh, all right, so soil obviously influences what plants grow there. That influences the animals that grow there. Big influence on uh, ecosystem structure. Okay, periodic disturbances. What just happened here? Forest fire. Okay, that's a periodic disturbance. And how periodically those things happen is important because a forest fire is a crucial way to cycle nutrients. Okay, and to sort of renew an ecosystem. Usually you don't get a fire in a healthy stand of trees, right? Because most of the time they're quite wet, okay, or green, so they don't burn, right? But you do often get it in old growth because there's a lot of deadfall, so a lot of stuff on the ground that's dry. The trees themselves are kind of old, and the, most of the stuff that's along the trunk is dead. There's only kind of the top that's still alive. So there's all this dry wood around that can burn easily, right? And so it's a good way, it, at that kind of point, it's important that things are, fires are allowed to happen because they'll renew the ecosystem, okay? That stuff will all fall down, it's partially decomposed by the fire already, so the nutrients can be cycled back in a little bit faster, okay? Um, and that allows, obviously, new growth along the ground, okay? Saplings and, and fireweed okay? and things like that, right? Does that sort of make sense? Yeah. Okay. Now, what's the problem with preventing that? What if what if we prevent forest fires from happening? Are we doing the ecosystem a favor, or are we kind of stifling it? Yeah, we we're, you kind of stifle it, and that's when things can get problematic. Okay, for years and years in the parks, okay, Banff and Jasper, Kananaskis, whatever, it was like, oh, we got to preserve these parks. We can't let forest fires happen because then they'll look ugly and people won't want to come and whatever else. And I mean. There is an argument to that no one wants to come and look at a burned down forest. But at the same time, no one wants to come and look at a forest that's been devastated by pine beetle either. All right? And we had that problem a few years back. The pine beetle came in and it just destroyed huge swaths of the forest in the Kananaskis and in Banff. In fact, when I was hiking, I had to divert around a control burn that they were doing to kill off the pine beetle. All right? They actually purposefully lit fires to kill the pine beetle off. All right? The reason that we got pine beetle? too much old growth that hadn't been allowed to burn when it could have. Right? The trees get old, they get sick, they can't fight the, the pine beetle off, and then that stuff spreads and it's worse. Okay? It's worse than a fire because 
then the fire the fire's not there those little seeds that are in those cones never get released because there's no heat okay so it takes it's we got to kind of let those things happen periodic disturbances are important because they redistribute the resources is there more sunlight getting to the ground yeah okay so that allows organisms on the ground to do a little bit better okay it changes things and it's important to have that change All right other types of um, disturbances could be hurricanes okay hurricanes often bring in you know uh, again a redistribution of sunlight because they'll knock down old trees okay um, they'll bring in a lot more moisture obviously uh, they can also bring in a lot of flood material Okay, and even though we, you know, we look at floods and we say, oh, floods are bad and whatever else, floods bring in a lot of nutrients, a lot of organic material, all right, and we've kind of seen that this year. If you went to any place and helped out with the flooding, you notice that silt that was everywhere, okay? That's the hardest part to clean out is all that sandy junk that comes along with it, but that sandy stuff is full of nutrients. Unfortunately, it's not good to have in your house because a lot of that's bacteria and stuff like that. But, okay, it's important for a natural community because it provides a lot of stuff for plants to grow in after the flood. All right, so you'll see next year on the floodplains lots of new growth, lots of bright green growth because there's lots more nutrients around there from all that silt and stuff that got deposited. Okay, um, so tornadoes, another thing, again, they knock down trees and redistribute how light gets there. What about volcanic eruptions? Well, they can create some land, yes. Okay, and in a lot of years, eventually that land will be colonized by plants and, and things like that. Um, it depends on the type of eruption. And if we're talking about a lava flow like you see in Hawaii, yes, it makes new land, but it sterilizes everything else that it goes over because it covers it in molten rock which then solidifies okay stuff doesn't generally grow after that for a while okay I mean some things do but not for a while okay if you got an eruption more like Mount St. Helens okay you get lots of ash and things like that which are actually really good for growing out of but again it takes a while because usually it's deposited by a, by a pyroclastic cloud that has been superheated and destroyed and sterilized everything under it right but again all that ash provides lots of sulfur and nitrogen and things that are good for plants to grow in over the long term so while they are devastating and kind of permanent disruptions of the ecosystem that was there at the time they do allow for other things to come along much later all right now Biotic factors, okay? Interactions of all those a uh, abiotic factors along with the organisms that live there, okay, are what make an environment what it is, right? Obviously, the organisms interact with these abiotic factors. You've got um, organisms in the soil that are turning the soil, like worms and bugs and things like that, that kind of cultivate and turn the soil for you. You've got decomposers, okay, that are breaking down the dead material and making organic material for for plants to grow, okay, stuff like that. It's all really important. It all has to work together. It's not one thing and then this thing. It's all of them working together. All right. Uptake of water by plants. We didn't really talk about this. We talked about the transport of it, but we didn't talk about really how it gets in. Okay, so water and minerals and salts get through the plant through the epidermis. Okay, any outer covering is called an epidermis, whether it's skin or whatever. Okay, so you've got the epidermis here on the outside, this layer of cells here. Okay, you've got the vascular cylinder. Okay, in here, that's where your phloem and xylem are going to be. Okay, and then you kind of got your cortex of the root. Okay, this green stuff here. And you can see there's the little root hairs coming off like this one here. All right. So it has to get across the root cortex. It has to get through here and into here. Now, what process is that going to be? Osmosis, yeah. Okay, it's got to be. It's water, right, that's moving. So water's got a choice. It can either go by osmosis, and if it does that, it has to go through the cells, or it can diffuse in the spaces between the cells. All right, there's advantages and disadvantages of each. The advantage of going in between all the cells is it's faster. Right? The advantage of going through all the cells is that you've got filtration happening and some things get kind of filtered out by osmosis on the way through. Okay? I don't know that this is necessarily in there, guys. It's just something for interest's sake. Okay? You don't need to know this. Okay? Just for additional kind of information here. Okay, so it comes across those root hairs, okay, again, they're extensions, you'll see all absorbing roots have them, 
Okay, there's the intracellular space, okay, and then there's again that vascular cylinder here in the middle. Okay, you've got the phloem, okay, here, and you've got your, your xylem, okay, kind of in the middle here. This X pattern is more your xylem. Okay. Um, and the soil particles, believe it or not, are coated in water. So if this here is a soil particle, water kind of sticks to the outside of it. Okay, and, and that's important because if it penetrates it, then it's harder to get at, right? That, then the, you know, the root hairs have to get smaller and, and things like that. Whereas if it's on the outside of that, root hairs can easily absorb it through, right? Um, clay type soils are difficult to get water out of because in clay type soils, the water actually gets in the particle itself, okay? And the particles are much, much smaller and finer, so they hold on to the moisture a lot better, right? Like if you ever were, when you were a kid, dug into your sandbox, right? At the bottom, there's always clay, okay? It's not because your parents put clay down there, right? I, we don't, okay? I know, I built the sandbox. I didn't put clay down there, and there's clay at the bottom of the sandbox now, right? And that's because clay is essentially made up of all the dust and fine stuff that lands on the sandbox and then gets washed through the sand, because sand grains are big. Clay particles are small, and they can get washed in between the sand particles and accumulate at the bottom, and they hold on to moisture really, really tightly, Right, so um, that if you got a really clayish soil, it's actually difficult for plants to grow there, even though the soil is moist. They can't pull the moisture out of it. Okay, in a sandy soil, it's also tough to grow because the sand is too hard and doesn't hold on to the moisture; it just evaporates away. So you need kind of a balance, okay, you need kind of a loamy soil. All right, I don't know why that's so small. Okay, uh, what it's talking about here, guys, are those two roots I was talking about, and I mean roots with OU not roots with two O's, okay? The routes, I should say, routes that it can take, okay, through to get into the xylem, okay? There's the apoplastic route, okay, where it diffuses in between all of the cells, okay? So it never actually gets into a cell, it just diffuses between them. That's the quick route, right? That's the one that takes all the minerals and things with it, right? The symplastic route means it actually goes through all of the cells, and in that case, that's a lot slower, Okay, and it filters a, a lot more of the stuff out. Okay, again, you're not going to need to know that. Okay, it's just interesting AP stuff. Okay. All right. Um, yeah, and so the um, when we have that symplastic route going on, that's where we have the selective absorption of minerals and. That's how some types of herbicides work. Okay, some types of herbicides will go through the uh, apoplastic route, and then they can get into the plant and poison them off. Okay, um, so those are ones that are absorbed by the roots. Okay, ones that are absorbed through the leaves are actually usually more effective because they can't be filtered. They get absorbed through the stomates and they get into the leaves. 2,4-D that we talked about yesterday works that way. It's actually the vaporous form of it that gets sucked in through the stomates and poisons the leaves, okay? Whereas other ones like spike and stuff like that actually poison the roots and kill the plant that way. All right. I'm going to skip that one too. All right. Two types of plants, okay? We can gr group plants into essentially two classes. Hydrophytes and, okay, xerophytes. Hydro usually means water, okay? And phyte or phyllic means, okay, I'm going to say it this way. It's kind of, don't take it the wrong way, but you won't forget it. A pedophile likes children. File, phyllic, phyte all mean loving, all right? Everybody with me there? That's what file means, okay? It's a suffix that means loving. Now you won't forget it. Hydrophytes are hydrophilic. They love water, okay? See, you won't forget now. I know it seems weird, but you won't forget it, okay? Zerophytes are the opposite. They love dry, okay? They can tolerate dry conditions. So hydrophytes are things that can tolerate lots and lots of water, flooded conditions, okay, and things like that. You can see, actually, in this picture here, Okay, this is in a tropical rainforest. Um, these these are actually roots. Okay, these things that are coming off the trees. Okay, they're specialized roots because these are also roots down here. Okay, but these roots don't work if they're flooded, and they are flooded for much of the year. In the tropical rainforest, for much of the year, the water level could be as high up as there, maybe even higher. So those other roots help to keep the tree sturdy 
but also allow oxygen to get in and get down to these roots that are submerged and wouldn't have access to it otherwise and then the tree would die. Okay, so this is a survival tactic of tropical rainforest plants. Okay, to give you some idea, okay, um, when I took this picture I couldn't get anyone to stand up there because it was hard to climb, but if I was to stand up there, that's how high up the tree they go, almost six feet. Okay, so they were as tall as I was up the tree. So water can get pretty deep in a lot of cases, and these trees can tolerate that. Okay, lilies, okay, water lilies, same idea, they can tolerate that. Okay, anything that would grow in a mangrove in like Florida or something like that also okay, can tolerate those kind of conditions. Okay. And then you got your xerophytes, which are the exact opposite. They have all kinds of adaptations to prevent the loss of water, okay, and, and to acquire water from exceptionally dry soil. The other thing they do is they have to keep animals away. Because if an animal chomps down on a xerophyte, they expose a lot of uh, wet tissue, and that would mean a lot of loss of water. So lots of xerophytes have thorns, right? and that keeps animals, most animals at least, from grazing on them. Okay. Now, um, again, for the cacti, the thorns are actually their leaves. The leaves have evolved and modified to the point where they don't actually carry out any photosynthesis anymore. They're strictly armor. Right? They're there to protect the, the rest of the cactus from being grazed on. Right? And then uh, that other picture there, a lot of the xerophytes are also what we call succulents, which means they have thick, really thick leaves. Okay, If they have leaves, they're really, really thick. Okay, and covered with a very, very thick waxy cuticle. All right? um, that's why if you ever cut into them, it's moist inside. Right? Everyone says, well, if I'm in the desert, I'll just punch a hole in a cactus and, you know, and drink the water out of it. When you punch a hole in a cactus, it's not like a fountain. Like, water doesn't come gushing out. All right? The only way you get water from a cactus is to cut the meat out and suck on it. All right? It's got lots of moisture in it, but a lot of cacti are very bitter. Right? They do, they're that way on purpose. Then nothing wants to eat them. Okay? It's a survival tactic in addition to the thorns. But it'll keep you alive, but it doesn't taste very good. Okay? Uh, some cacti are a little sweeter, like prickly pear that grows around here is a little bit sweeter. Okay? Again, though, you've got to mine the thorns. Okay? But you can cut them off. You can actually cook them even. Okay? Um, some animals, though, are adapted to eat these. Okay? Anybody know what animal eats cactus? Lives around, well, not maybe around here, but a little further south. Antelope. Okay. Antelope will chomp right down on prickly pear cactus. Their tongue and the inside of their mouth is like shoe leather. Okay. It's tough. So they can chomp right down and the thorns don't penetrate. Okay. They can actually eat the thorns right off, just chew on the cactus. Right. Very few organisms are like that. But antelope also have very efficient kidneys. They can function with very little water. In fact, many antelope will never actually drink a whole lot of water in their lifetime. Okay? They'll mostly survive on the water in the food they eat. Okay? Like they rarely urinate, so they don't lose a lot of water. All right. Uh, so the other adaptations here are ones we talked about, right? Stomata are concentrated on the lower leaf surface, and you know, or they're located in depressions where they're protected. Okay, but we've already talked about that kind of stuff. Okay. And so in the driest months, desert, desert plants will sometimes lose their leaves if they have them, okay? And cacti will subsist on water stored in the fleshy stems in the rainy season, okay? Um, some will absorb CO2 through their stomates only during the night, okay? So C4 plants, they'll absorb, they'll only open their stomates at night. So they'll collect the solar energy during the day, but they won't allow the evaporative part of photosynthesis to occur until the night time. So they actually separate the two parts of photosynthesis and that helps them to conserve water as well. Right, but again, that only happens in the C4 type of plants that we said we weren't going to go over. Right, just for interest's sake there. Alright, so that's it for that one, guys. Now, you've got a bit of time, and that was actually my plan, was to give you some time because you've got a bunch of things coming up here. So you got a bit of time to uh, to work on some of those today including your uh, 
water, well, if you can get maybe the uh, hypothesis and variables and whatever done for that water transport lab, okay, you got a little bit of time to work on that as well. In fact, you got about a half an hour to work on that, so let's make good use of that time.